Good morning. So I love that passage. I love how it speaks not only of us growing up into maturity in Christ, but also the nature in which that happens um, with us uh, acting towards each other out of brotherly and sisterly love and drawing all of our strength and our source from Jesus Christ, um, the head of the body. And if you want something to frame everything we're going to look at this morning, everything coming from Christ and being worked out in the context of brotherly and sisterly love in him is a great framework in which to hear everything this morning that we have to, to look at. Um, I am going to take probably slightly longer than we try to do on Zoom services normally. So if you need to go and grab yourself a cup of coffee, feel free to do that. If halfway through you think oh, I'm parched and I just want a glass of water, feel free. No one's um, watching on the little screens to see what you're doing. And, and if they are, we'll know why. Uh, but we just need to take the, the time this morning. Also, if you haven't yet picked it up through the various notices this coming Wednesday, we have a church forum and that forum will be aimed at looking at how we put what we're talking about this morning into practice as a congregation and it'll be a further chance to discuss it and to ask questions so do please make sure that you prioritize that as well. Throughout the history of the scriptures and in fact throughout the history of God having a people, um, obviously that extending past the scriptures into the current age, God has led his people and he's guided them in different ways. You might think about Moses saying to the Lord, don't send us up unless you go with us. In Exodus 33, he, there was this desire not, not just to go in his strength, but to be led by him. Um, and Israel became a people who followed that cloud wherever it went. When the cloud lifted and moved on, they decamped and set out. And as soon as it stopped, they would set camp and they'd be there for however long God said. You might think about uh, Saul and Barnabas meeting in Antioch and the spirit says, set aside Saul and Barnabas for the work to which I've called them. And then throughout the book of Acts, you see these uh, interactions with the guiding of the Holy Spirit, where, for instance, they, they want to go to southern Turkey and they're prevented by the Holy Spirit and they want to go to northern Turkey and they're prevented by the Holy Spirit and they end up in, in western Turkey and they have this vision of a man from Macedonia. And so they, they feel this calling to go over and respond to that need. And in fact, later on, uh, when they're in Ephesus, we read about Paul saying, and now I'm on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit. There's this understanding that uh, we're, we're led by the Lord as the people of God. We could look at Peter and Cornelius, who in different ways were led to see the gospel come to the Gentiles. We could look at Philip, who was led away from a revival in Samaria to a desert road, but out of that a church was born in Ethiopia. It's all Holy Spirit to lead God's people on. And that's not a matter of revealing new, uh, new doctrine about God. We have the full revelation of who God is in Jesus Christ and in the scriptures that tell us about Jesus Christ. So this is not suggesting that the Holy Spirit has more secret truths to tell us. This is about saying the Holy Spirit leads us in how we live out the truths that have already been revealed by Jesus Christ. And that's the way that we want to live. We want to live as a people who are led by the Spirit, um, standing on the truth of the word. And those two things, of course, are always in harmony, the word of God and the Spirit of God. I suspect that isn't news to any of us, actually, because probably almost all of us could relate to taking a situation to the Lord and after a while feeling peace about a particular action or outcome. Or maybe we might say, I was reading the scriptures and I felt led to this particular passage. That's the leading of the Holy Spirit. What I want to talk about this morning is a more specific, a more um, precise version of that in which I believe the Holy Spirit is leading us as a church. So, just to give us a, a bit of an understanding of how this sits together, I just want to talk a little bit about how God has been leading us a little bit over the last year. And in the context of that, just very briefly, we, we can always best understand the bits of the story that, that we have experienced firsthand. So I just want to give a bit of a recap of how God led us as a family to join with you at WCC. And I hope you'll see in that there's a sense of continuity here. 
We didn't originally look to live in horse path, but God led us here, partly through circumstance that was mainly around um, needing an, a house that could be adapted for accessibility. And that didn't seem to be available within the, the ring road. It was partly miraculous provision. Caroline and I were reflecting the other day that the house that we're in now was outside anything that we could afford. And we set ourselves to pray and fast and um, over 70,000 pounds un unexplainedly <laughs> came our way, unexpectedly rather, I came our way. We've not spoken to anybody about praying and fasting and it made this this possible we had a strong sense ourselves when we were praying that this was the house that we should be looking to move into um, and there were various things as we went further down the road that confirmed that and so there was a there was a sense of the coming together of circumstance and provision and uh, peace as we prayed and and then sort of less than a year later uh, there was the whole set of circumstances that led us to join Wheatley Community Church and that again was some circumstance so uh, the leadership team of WCC reaching out um, to OCC and just saying uh, we'd be interested in a Sunday speaker one week and I felt stirred to get in touch with my leadership team and say weren't we having some conversations a while back maybe we should have a bit more of a conversation about whether there's more of a, a relationship to be had here and so we all ended up meeting in our lounge here in Horsepath and there was that circumstance. As that circumstance came together, I remember something stirring in my heart and thinking, these Wheatley guys are on an adventure. That sounds interesting. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of myself being involved in any way other than just, it seems there's something here that was good. And then came some wise counsel. Boss and his boss at our annual appraisal said, we just, we think that this is the right move for you. There's this role here as um you know in, in wcc we think this would be the right step for you and so i took on board the circumstance and the, the wise counsel and then we prayed about it and also felt stirred about it and we wrote away to friends of ours who live in italy who have what i would describe as the strongest clearest prophetic gift that of anyone we know and we just said we're thinking about a significant life decision um so would you please just pray and see if God shows you anything that would be helpful to us? And what they shared was just so confirming that this was the right decision to make. One word that sticks with me was um, Graham, one of, one of the chaps, had, had a, a picture of somebody stepping from a pavement out into a traffic island. And he said, it, you're, you're going for, it's like you're going from a more crowded place into a place that's smaller and, and it will feel more exposed, but it's absolutely the right next step. And so the combination of circumstance and counsel and personal peace from prayer and others' prophetic insight came together to lead us strongly. And it's those same factors that I want to pick up on this morning in terms of how God is leading us on as a fellowship. Circumstance, counsel and insight from the prophetic. So look around us at the moment. Circumstance puts us in an interesting place, doesn't it? It's as though COVID-19 has just put a pause on so much that we do. Back in October, we were saying we might need to stop some things in order to refocus. And we couldn't imagine stopping anything. And, you know, there's other things, there's other narratives going on here. But one thing that's happened is God has put his finger on all this activity and just said, just pause. Just for a minute, just stop. And in that moment, we suddenly have headspace to think and to plan and to change what we do. There's circumstance. Over the last year, I've also had the privilege of speaking to an awful lot of you about what goes on in the church and to hear um, the excitement and the vision and the frustrations and the difficulties and the half-realized plans and all of these things. And, and I feel from that we've been able to draw wise counsel. And I've also had the privilege of a fantastic leadership team, again, with wise counsel there and we've talked things over and we've processed what's going on and what's working and what's not working and so on. But there's also some very specific um, prophetic insight from God and I use that word um, advisedly because I, I believe this is guidance that God has given us for this season um, in order to best live out how, you know, how God has called us to live out life as WCC. As part of moving here, a bunch of pastors from across the county who Caroline and I 
uh, have got to know over the years. We gathered and we prayed and we prayed for a few things, but specifically this one time we we focused on Wheatley Community Church and what God was doing in Wheatley. And one chap, a guy called Paul, a lovely guy from Chipping Norton, he had this picture that he felt was from God. And he said, you know, weigh it, see what you think. But this, I, I think this might be something that God's saying. And it was of three wheels. And there was grit in these wheels such that they weren't really turning properly, but they, you know, there they were ready to go. And he said, I, I saw that you sort of immediately got a brush and set to work cleaning as though you could, just the thing to do was to clean the grit out of the wheels. And God said, no, don't do that. Hang all of your weight on the biggest wheel. And the biggest wheel had this label on it that said mission. And as you hang your weight on that biggest wheel, all the wheels will start to turn. And sure enough, they did. And as they turned, the grit kind of just worked its way out. But more to the point, the wheels were turning. And I sat with that for a while. And the more I sat with it, the more I thought, I, I think before God, this is this is really right actually this is helpful advice um, from not advice this is a helpful steer from the lord on how to start and back in october we had a church forum and i really just kind of said i think we should look at mission as an act of faith that i thought this was god's leading but what rapidly became apparent was that that was very much on everyone's minds once we sat down and looked at what we did we, if you weren't at that forum, we categorised everything that we did into what it, whereabouts in the journey of faith it sat. Was it first contact, people who've never met a Christian before? Was it circulating in a community and trying to help people to have a good impression of Christianity and Jesus? Was it helping people intentionally journey towards faith? Or was it discipling people who had already come to faith? And what we found was that they, we did lots at the, the start of that process, lots of first contact, lots of being in the community, almost nothing um, in terms of helping people make intentional journeys of faith uh, where they might actually commit to becoming a Christian. And then a reasonable amount around discipleship, although mainly focused on our young people. So as soon as we started to see that actually that wasn't just one person's view, but that was right across the church, we recognised it. It just confirmed to me that this was actually, that this was something that God was trying to lead us into. Three particular focuses with the first one being mission. And so today um, I want to talk to you about what these three things are. Now I... I could stand up here and say, here's my vision for the church, or we as the leadership team could stand up and say, this is our vision for the church. And there's probably a place for that. But I want to be really clear this morning. I, I don't think that is what we're doing. Actually, what we've done is uh, I and uh, the leaders as well have sat with these things. And we believe this is what God is doing in us as a community. This is what God wants to work on. And we have a choice. We can let him get on with it because he's sovereign and we'll kind of sit there and you know fine or we can wholeheartedly say yes i want to cooperate with what god is doing in us let's throw ourselves into it let's look at the activity we do and, and only start things which are really in line with this let's um let's make sure that our our home groups and our teaching program and uh, everything that we do together is seeking to further these three things and I'd like to commend that approach to us. Um, I've had a bit of a notes catastrophe here. So if I occasionally have to fiddle with bits of paper, apologies for that. Um, there we go. But I also want to be clear, this is not new vision. We've not totally thrown out everything that WCC was and said, here's a whole bunch of new stuff. We actually have a stated vision as a church. Um, you can find it in our handbook. I think you can find it on the website. And uh, while we might want to revisit that from time to time, this is actually not about going back to our vision and changing that. Um, this is about priorities. Just a school, all kinds of things matter in a school. Your educational outcomes, your safeguarding, your curriculum development, your leadership development, your staff culture, your kids' mental health, facilities maintenance, all these kind of things. Uh, but when we visited Wheatley Park looking um, for secondary schools, the headmaster said he'd come in thinking that one thing would be a priority, but actually had discovered that really he needed to focus on staff culture. I can't remember what the other thing was he mentioned now. Um, so he said, I've spent two years just focusing on the staff culture and development. 
Now, during that time, safeguarding still mattered. Educational outcomes still mattered. They still wanted to be a school that taught kids um, how to be you know, well-educated citizens in the world. They still wanted to make sure everyone was safe. They needed to make sure the buildings weren't falling down. But their priority was working on staff culture. That was where their focus was. And so this morning, what we're laying out is not, these are the only things that matter in a church. There's, there's far more that we won't cover that absolutely matters, but rather here are some areas for growth and development for us. This is like that passage in Ephesians, how we can become mature. These are the areas we need to grow in to become more mature. So what are they? Well, I have a PowerPoint because I have a feeling that otherwise we will lose our way as we go along. So hopefully you can all see that and I'll just be a little small bit at the side of the screen. Priorities for the coming season. And the first one is this. Um, I've chosen the word witness rather than mission because mission is a very broad term and uh, particularly with the summer we've just had, we'll probably be thinking among other things of overseas mission, the COVID hardship fund, and those are all fantastic things. Actually, I think WCC has one of the most generous approaches to overseas mission that I've seen in a church. So while that's important, I don't think that that is currently an area that we need to grow and develop in. This is specifically about local, it's about our lives, first-hand sharing the gospel. I've not said personal witness, which is a term I've heard quite a lot because it's not just about individuals, but also about us working together. And I've mentioned already that we had a really fruitful church forum um, back in October looking at what this looks like and perhaps what our church activity currently is and how it could develop. But actually one thing that came out of that forum is that most of us are on a very similar footing. We have not seen anyone born again firsthand in the last five to ten years, most of us. And what happens in that time is that we get rusty sharing the gospel. If we haven't put it on our lips in five, ten years, then perhaps we don't remember how to, or maybe nobody ever taught us how to share the gospel in a compelling and engaging way. Or perhaps we have shared and it wasn't well received and we felt awkward or rejected or whatever your particular weakness is when somebody doesn't receive the gospel. And over time, what's happened is that some encrusted disillusionment or disappointment has set in. And we find ourselves thinking, well, I could say something, but why would this time be any different? Just pause a second and think, is, is that something that you've ever thought? Why would this time be any different? People don't seem really to know the gospel. It's time for us as a church to grow more confident in saying what we know to be true. There is a loving father in heaven and he longs to be reconciled to his children who are lost and wandering, sheep without a shepherd. And he is there saying, I want you come home. There is a gospel of good news that says Jesus Christ has made a way and can grow and become more confident in how we explain that to people and how we show it to them. There's more for us here, learning to explain the gospel more fluently. But not only that, it's also that it's very easy to become comfortable, isn't it? And to end up in the same circle of friends where perhaps the people that might have been interested in the gospel, we've already had that conversation and either they've received Jesus or they've decided not to. And then the others are, are closed. And this is the same group that we've hung out in for the last five, 10, 20 years. And there's nobody new there. So nothing's going to shift. The fact is it was true for Jesus and Jesus said it would be true for us. Not everybody will receive the gospel. It's a narrow path to salvation and a wide path to destruction is what Jesus said. Caroline and I have consistently found that it's when we try to broaden our horizons, try to mix more widely, try to meet new people, as well as um, staying in touch with the old, that God introduces us to people who are open to the gospel. And there are undoubtedly people in Wheatley and the surrounding villages who simply don't have a Christian friend to tell them, but would jump at the chance 
to become a Christian. There was a survey done by the Church of England just a few years ago now, five years ago maybe, and it said that of every five people who have had a one conversation with a Christian friend about faith, one never wants to hear about it again, three are really open to, and the last, the fifth person desperately wants to hear more and is waiting for the other person to say something. That's the stats they ran. Isn't that incredible? One in five people who have heard something of the gospel want to hear more and are just waiting for somebody to make the first move and three more are really open to a conversation. If we're going to continue to mix with more people and to find those who are interested in the gospel, we're going to have to reshape our lives. That means stepping out of discomfort. It means maybe giving up something so that we could take up a new hobby, or it means volunteering in a new setting so that we can mix and mingle with new people. We've also found consistently um, right through our experience of church, Caroline and I, that very few people have all the gifts required to go from meeting somebody for the first time through to seeing them born again. Actually, I'm just thinking about the last person that I saw born again. Um, the initial sort of groundwork was that they were working in a school where there are a number of Christian teachers who modelled what Christ's love looked like in the workplace. And then I got to go in there as a chaplain and I started this alpha course um, based on a prompting from God that that was the right next thing. And I talked to all the Christian teachers and said, invite your friends. It's going to be good. Let's do this. But no sooner had we started the course than actually a whole number of things changed and it was only women on the course. And I ended up handing over to Caroline to mostly lead the course. And she walked uh, with this one lady who did get born again. She walked most of that journey with her. She actually got born again in between weeks. She took away a prayer and prayed it. And then Caroline kind of walked her through the, the next few weeks of the Alpha course. And then it's her Christian colleagues who've picked up the baton again to see her plugged into a church and, and living in the good of that. So it was a team effort. And this isn't a surprise. God has made us as a community to work together. He's made us as a body, just like we read in Ephesians. He's made us to work together with every part doing its function. So witness is about learning to explain the gospel fluently. It's learning to reshape our lives so that we can prioritize personal witness, but it's also learning to work together. In that, it's learning to support each other. It's learning to get alongside each other. It's finding out who are the people who are great at making first contact and then don't know what to do afterwards. Who are the people who are a bit shy initially, but get them into the right conversation and they can explain the gospel compellingly, or they have the insight to, to ask that question that draws a response of faith, just as Jesus did so well. That's the first priority I believe God is leading us in, is growth in our witness. And I'm really excited about what that could look like for the church. I hope you are too. The second then is around discipleship. Now, when it comes to change, most of us fall into one of two camps. A lot of us don't like change, resist change by default. You know, the, the, the existing is good change is uncomfortable, let's just keep going with what we know. And there's then another response, which is, I love change, I'm always changing stuff, I love innovating, and I struggle to stick with anything. And most of us have a strong default one way or the other, you'll know what you are. In our household, Caroline is generally more towards the um, resisting change, and I'm more towards the change everything and don't stick with anything. Although actually, thankfully, there's a good synergy there that we help each other with. But Discipleship is all about change. And if we're serious about witness, that's going to involve a lot of change as well. And so we have to work out this relationship to change. Um, there's a, there is this thing of being a gift to each other in the midst of change. One of the things I love about our home group is that we're working our way through some challenging material, but I know for a fact that for instance, the kind of challenges that we, we might have for each other, that friend who you have been talking about wanting to pray for, have you actually prayed for them? Are you going to pray for them this week, even though it's at work and it's a bit uncomfortable? Or um, praying for healing, actually, we've had some challenges about praying for healing. We've had some challenges about sharing the gospel with people. And what I know in that home group is that if I stuff up, 
and I share that with the home group, there will be people who will cheer me up and say, look, OK, never mind. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't go to plan. They'll pray for me and they'll encourage me to give it another go. And I know that they'll celebrate with me if I do it right. And if I actually do what I said I was going to do and I pray for that person or I share the gospel with that person or I try to forgive this person or whatever it might be. There's people who will prod me and say, you said last week that you were really stirred about doing this. Have you done it? It's that kind of relationship. They are 100% for me. They want the best for me, but they're not afraid to ask the difficult questions. And as a result, we have all been growing because we've gone and done the things that God was stirring us to do in a supportive, loving environment, um, but also a challenging environment. And that is the heart of discipleship. So as we've started conversations around mission, it's become apparent that if we're going to see the kind of change, the reshaping of our lives, growing more confident, sharing the gospel, but also looking out for ways to engage with unsaved people. We're going to need this kind of environment in which there's support, in which there's um, encouragement, in which there's provocation as well to actually follow through on what it is that we've said that we'll do or God is prompting us to do. And in that we, we have the opportunity to, to confront fear. We have the opportunity to walk free of all kinds of habits and patterns that we've got ourselves into. I really loved David Campbell's talk at the beginning of the year on Jonah, where he gave us those discipleship questions that they have. And I feel like this is something that God has got for us um, to grow in discipleship. The great thing is that if God highlights something like this, it's because he is willing and able to help us grow. And so if you're hearing this and thinking, oh, here's, here's two things that we need to grow in, that must be two things that we're not very good at. I just want to encourage you that that's not the words of a good father. The words of a good father are, I am here, I am willing and able, will you take my hand, will you grow? What we see in the New Testament is both discipling peer to peer, so we could look at Hebrews 10, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us consider how we may spur each other on to love and good deeds and all the more as the day approaches. We could look at Colossians 3, where he encourages um, the believers to teach and admonish each other. But actually, you could look at the last chapters of 1 Thessalonians, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, James. They're all full of these um, exhortations to have this kind of peer-to-peer, -peer, honest, vulnerable, discipling relationship. I mean, James talks about confessing your sins to one another. I mentioned that last week. It's uncomfortable, but actually the fruit of it is good. So we have these peer-to-peer -peer relationships in the New Testament um, in which we are discipling one another and encouraging and spurring one another on. And we also see an intentional setup where less mature believers attach themselves to more mature believers to learn from them. And you have, for instance, Apollos with Priscilla and Aquila, where he preaches the baptism of John and they take him in and they explain the way of God more adequately to him. And look what that does in terms of his ministry. You just have to read the, the other references to him in, in Acts and the other letters to see that that launches him out in such a powerful way. We could look at Timothy with Paul. Actually, it goes beyond the period of the scriptures, unsurprisingly. So the apostle John discipled Ignatius, not the one from Loyola, who's the, the Catholic saint, but Ignatius of Antioch. Um, and also Polycarp, perhaps a name that you've heard of, who became Bishop of Smyrna in Turkey. Polycarp um, discipled Ir Irenaeus as well. And you see these relationships going down the generations where people attach themselves to somebody who has gone further in the faith than they have, perhaps is longer in the tooth than them. And they say, I want to learn from you. I want to imitate you as you imitate Christ. Again, taking Paul's turn of phrase. And those relationships are really fruitful. So this is the second priority, discipleship. And I've broken it down into three again, sharing our lives, our spiritual lives in an open, honest, vulnerable manner. Being real about things um, as they truly are in our hearts, being willing to bring out the dirty laundry, being willing to celebrate, genuinely celebrate with those who are celebrating, to mourn with those who are mourning, all of that kind of thing. Talking about peer-to-peer, -peer, welcoming feedback, 
Uh, there's a the, the headmaster at Tyndale School where our kids go. He will actively go to the most obstreperous parents, the ones who really are always complaining, and he'll go to them for feedback, partly because it draws them in and brings them onto the side of, you know, the same side, as it were, but also because he goes, well, that's where we'll get the most honest feedback, isn't it? And he has this culture of feedback as a friend. What would it be like if we were really like that with our friends? I want your feedback, even if it hurts. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. And also, as well as that peer-to-peer -peer, um, engagement, also looking for how can we disciple those who are less mature in the faith than us? How can we look to those who are more mature in the faith and learn from them? So that's the second one. We've had witness. We've What's the third one? Just half an eye on the time. Good. OK. And it's this. It's life in the spirit. Now, I tried to come up with a, a one word version for this because we've got witness and we've got discipleship. And I ended up saying it would be it would be style over substance. I can't find a snappier way to say this. But perhaps, you know, the story of the man who gets a job as a lumberjack and he goes out with his with his chainsaw on the first day and he comes back to his boss and he says I chopped down four trees today and his boss says well okay it's your first day but actually most most of your colleagues are doing 10 to 12 so next next day a little bit more hard work please so the next day he goes out and he comes back covered in sweat I did six trees today and his boss says look oh, I, I was expecting you to be performing a bit better than this I'll tell you what I'll come out with you tomorrow and uh, so the next day he and his boss go out slinging their chainsaws and they get to the first tree and the boss says look I'll show you how it's done and he starts his chainsaw <laughs> and the other man goes ah what's that and we can be like that in our Christian lives can't we we, can, we have a chainsaw on our hands and there we are manually soaring away and the, the scriptures tell us that the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, is living in us and able to transform how we live. And the more conversations I've had around WCC, the more I found that actually so many of us are on the edge of this. We, you know, we know that God can heal and will sometimes pray for a healing, but actually we don't have confidence in that yet. And maybe we don't know, quite know how to talk to other people about it. Or we're used to the idea that when we're praying about something and we don't know what to do, God might lead us to a scripture, but we don't quite know, like, is that really God or is it just me opening the Bible at random? And certainly in terms of going beyond that to how might God proactively guide us for the road ahead, we're, we're just lacking confidence. Actually, one of the most effective tools in outreach is that prompting of the Holy Spirit. Jesus at the well saying, go fetch your husband. And then you're right, you don't have a husband. You've had five and the man you're living with at the moment isn't your husband. Look how that opened up the conversation. We could look at so many more. It's also one of the most effective tools in, in pastoral ministry and in discipleship. And I've shared stories here before of how God has put his finger on issues in people's lives because it was in the dark and they were not bringing it out and he wanted to see people free of it. And so the Holy Spirit nudges somebody and says, you need to talk about that. And those are only just a couple of examples of the broad range of gifts that the Holy Spirit gives his church. The Holy Spirit gives these gifts for the building up of the church and our church needs to be built up. I'm not saying we're a bad church. I love our church. I'm just saying we need to be built up. There is more for us in God. There is more for us in this village and the other villages around us than we are yet experiencing and we need the upbuilding of the Holy Spirit. Of the broad range of gifts that the Holy Spirit gives the church, there are some that we already excel in. I would say that we have excellent administrators in our church. I know that we have good teachers in our church, for instance. We have great servers in our church. You see it variously described as the, the gift of service or of helps or other, other words that equate to that. And so if those are your gifts, you'll probably think, well, this is great. We're already appreciated. And you may not realize that there are people who have other gifts in this church who will feel like they, they haven't got a place. Maybe they recognize it and they know, I know God's given me this and I don't know how to use it in the church. I don't know if I'll be received with this gift or quite possibly they haven't even quite identified that, but there's a frustration that I, there's something about 
me and the church that's not connecting and the reason is that god's given them a gift and we don't know how to make space for that gift in our church at the moment there are some gifts that we just don't know what to do with at the moment i don't think we know what to do with the gift of prophecy i don't think we know what to do with the gift of healing discerning between spirits speaking in and interpreting tongues those are all gifts that the the new testament lays out for us and at the moment we haven't worked out what to do with them so if there's somebody who's excelling in one of those gifts in our congregation they're going to feel frustrated because there's a foot in the church and the body doesn't know what to do with the foot and so they're not walking or there's an eye and the body doesn't know what to do with the eye so it's shut there's a breadth of us uh, of life for us to discover um, as everybody gets to function in the way that God has made them to function. And this ties in with our series on the Holy Spirit at the end of last year, sorry, at the end of last year, in that summer of last year rather, um, which ended with a provocation of how will we make space for the full breadth of the gifts of the Spirit in our meetings. This is where I want to leave things with the life and the Spirit really, is that we learn to recognize the promptings of the Holy Spirit that we recognize and grow in a wide range of gifts and that we make space for the leading of the Holy Spirit in our meetings. And that's right there in the middle of our vision, that we are a people who are open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's been there in every vision statement of WCC that I've seen. And I think that's one that we have still not quite worked out. So hopefully, as you've seen these, these are not sort of some crazy new idea. These are all things that the church has needed to grow in. The capital C church globally has needed to grow in over years. But specifically for us at the moment, I believe this is where God is leading us to grow in our witness, our gospel fluency and, and fruitfulness, to grow in discipleship, honesty, um, genuine love worked out in difficult and easy and celebratory and morning conversations with each other, intentional peer-to-peer -peer and uh, sort of mentor-mentee uh, relationships, and life in the spirit, growing in confidence that God guides us today and that he gives a, a breadth of gifts and a richness of gifts to grow his church. Now I know that as we look at those things, some of you will find some of them more challenging than others. And there might be a response that says, well, I'm up for these, but that one, mm, no, I'm not so sure. And others may be saying, look, this is all, <laughs> I might as well not tuned in this morning because this is all stuff I already thought. And I just want to encourage us to be real here. Some of the things that seem incredibly daunting as we look at them, and we're, we're planning to have teaching series um, that will unpack some of these. As we start to look at them, you'll realize that they aren't as daunting as you think. And others that sound very simple will actually be quite costly. Really reshaping our lives around mission will be costly. It will take time and effort. It will require us to open our hearts to new people and it will require us to, as Jesus did, do rejection by those who don't want to hear anything about Jesus Christ. And we'll have to push through that and get each other through it with the help of the Lord and move on to new people and see those who really do want to hear the good news get to hear it. Discipleship, that will involve bringing out some stuff we don't really want to share. It will involve allowing people enough visibility of our lives that they can ask us questions that really matter. And it will involve giving ourselves so much in love to each other that we want the best for each other and we're willing to encourage and celebrate and we're willing to have the difficult conversation in which we provoke or challenge. And life in the spirit, for some people it's something that you've never received teaching on or you've heard little bits and pieces or maybe in some cases you've heard about the abuses of it but not the sort of wonderful healthy outworking of it. There'll be sort of learning and growing to do there and all growing is stretching and sometimes painful but it will be worth it the fruit is going to be good as we grow in confidence in witnessing we will see the father reconcile to more of his lost children 
as we grow in discipleship, we will become more Christ-like, which is our goal, isn't it? We want to be more Christ-like. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit as we focus on life in the Spirit. I want to commend these three things to you. I believe that these are three things that God is laying out ahead of us, and they are three opportunities to grow. And I want to ask um, that we take time to pray, to ask God how we can engage with them, and that we take hold of these opportunities with both hands and step into them in unity. I'm going to call it a morning there. We'll have plenty more time to talk, um, including on Wednesday evening. Do please make it there.